water if they get those high notes. My goodness. <laughs> All right. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Psalm 28 for our reading today. Uh, for those of you who are new, returning, or visiting, um, this is the part of the show where <laughs> uh, we read the psalm together as a church. This has been the historic practice of the church throughout most of the last 2,000 years. Uh, we have, uh, as the body of Christ, gotten great benefit from, from reading the Psalms together. So I'll be reading out of the ESV. Um, if you have another translation, feel free to continue to read along loudly and proudly. We will be beginning in Psalm 28, verse 1. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, Lord, my rock, be not be dead to me, to me lest, lest if, if you be silent to me, I become, become like those who go down to the pit. the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy Lord. sanctuary. Do when not drag me off with, with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who seek peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their words and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work the operation of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart Therefore, exalts. My heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise him. And with him. my song I give thanks to him. The Lord, Lord is, is the strength, strength of his he people. He is the saving strength of he his anointed. He is anointing. the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save, save your people, people and bless, bless your heritage. inheritance. Be their shepherd also, and carry them forever. And lift forever. them up forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We cherish it for what it is. Pray now that as we shift from glorifying you through song and psalm, and we go into studying your word, that your spirit would be here with us, present, guiding us, teaching us, and conforming us to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study through the Gospel of Matthew today. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open them to Matthew chapter 5. Again, we're going to be covering an expansive length of scripture, a whopping four verses a lot. So, I'll ask the congregation to please stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. These are the words of the Lord. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are the words of the Lord. Receive them as such. You may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> One of, uh, one of my favorite pastor, theologian, uh, smart boys that I like to follow, uh, his name is James White, and you heard me probably reference him a little bit. Uh, and he talks about how one time, and the church that they gather in is an old church, it's like, it's even older than this one, it goes way back. And uh, he talks about how one time he really shocked everybody there by playing a clip from a TV show in like an old reformed church. And uh, the show that he played a clip from was called The West Wing. And some of you may be more familiar with the show than I am. I haven't really watched it. But I, I listened to the clip that he shared. And uh, apparently in the show, there is a professing Christian. And again, I don't know all about the show. But uh, she is ridiculed by this other character uh, who finds out that she's a professing Christian. And says, okay, well, then um, 
you know, my neighbor, I saw him wearing mixed fabrics the other day. So how do I go about executing them? Do I stone them or do I burn them at the stake? Oh, and then I also saw um, my other neighbor eating shrimp. Uh, so how are we supposed to go about stoning them or, or killing them? And then the character just goes on and on, listing all of these um, quotes from Leviticus and from Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were here with us for our Leviticus study, you remember that there is some context that is left out of that. But <laughs> the point of it that, that the show is, is making is, like, ah, these dumb Christians, they're not consistent with their beliefs. They don't even know what their own books are. And unfortunately, that's true for the large majority of Christians. Most people who claim to be Christian today don't know what the book says, nor do they understand how it all fits together, nor do they understand how Christ used it. And we have to be prepared to answer these things. This is um, our responsibility that uh, we are charged with from Scripture. Peter says in, in his epistle, be ready to make a defense of your faith. Amen. And so um, we're going to learn a little bit about how to do that today. And in order to do that, um, we're going to need to learn some theology proper. So we're going to need to learn some terminology and some of what they meant. And since Dustin's here, I brought my whiteboard today <laughs> so that way we could <clears throat> focus in on some of these terms. Anytime he's out here, I can't resist to break out the whiteboard. Hopefully it won't fall down. I haven't had it fall down while I was using it yet. Um, but there are four terms that I want us to focus in on. Uh, the first and hopefully, oh good, my marker works. <clears throat> Barely. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> um, the first is verbal plenary inspiration. Now, I was a teacher for a long time, so do not judge my handwriting. <laughs> there will not be any of that. <laughs> the second is um, uh, eisegesis and exegesis. Again, don't judge my handwriting and don't judge my spelling. <laughs> the third is the perspicuity of scripture. And uh, the last is antinomianism and theonomy. I won't ask for a show of hands uh, or call on anyone to define those terms yet at the end. So, uh, these uh, may sound a little strange at first, but you'll find, I think, as we go through them, that you're like, oh yeah, I knew that. I just hadn't articulated it that way. And I think it's important for us to be able to um, defend why we believe what we believe. And in order to do that, we have to learn and devote ourselves to a little bit of study. And uh, we're, we're going to be called to a, a higher level of understanding. So with that in mind, uh, let's look at the text. In verse 17, which is the first verse that we're going to look at today, uh, the Lord says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, yeah, that's an amen-worthy verse. Uh, just before we get into this, I want you to notice um, that his, his, his phrase there, the law and the prophets, that is a... a, a uh, term used to encompass the entirety of the Old Testament. The law, which is, you know, the writings of Moses, uh, the writings, the prophets would be, uh, you know, the prophets. So Christ is talking to them about the Old Testament. Now, what I want us to really notice here is that there's no controversy about what these books are, about which books he's talking about. The Pharisees don't respond and go, well, Jesus, haven't you read in 1 Maccabees? Or they don't quote from the Apocrypha, because neither they nor Christ believe those are scripture, and they're correct in that. So, uh, Christ says to them, and what, this is one of his uh, most common phrases throughout the Gospels, he says, have you not read? Right? And so what he's referring to there is, didn't you read the scriptures? And many times he follows that phrase up with, have you not read or have you not heard what God spoke to you through 
the prophets. Amen. That is a radical statement that we skip over because we're from, you know, conservative Bible believing churches. Of course, uh, most people don't believe that. They call themselves Christians and have no idea of Christ's own view of Scripture. But Christ had uh, what we call a verbal plenary inspiration view of Scripture, which basically just means verbal word plenary, the whole, and inspiration uh, inspired by God. That every word of Scripture is the word of God. Amen. See, I told you, you all know this. We're just going to work through it a little bit. <laughs> And so when we, it's important for us to understand this, because if we're going to call ourselves Christians, it's very important that we have the same view of Scripture as Christ. Amen. Because if we're not going to share his beliefs, we can't call ourselves Christian. Amen. And again, that probably sounds uh, pretty, pretty basic to a lot of you, hopefully, uh, but it is not. Throughout the last couple hundred years especially, the attacks on the inerrancy of Scripture have never been higher. Uh, if you were going to a Bible college or a seminary in the 1800s, you were taught, for example, that, well, the Gospel of John, there's no way the Gospel of John could have been written by John. Its view of Christ is too high. It presents him as divine, and nobody believed that until at least the middle of the second century. So this had to be at least 150, 200 A.D., way later. And uh, modern archaeology, however, has proven that that is uh, ridiculous. A, because we found writings from church fathers in the early 2nd century that quote from the Gospels. But it had to be earlier than that. And uh, the coolest thing to me is uh, the oldest um, manuscript that we have of the New Testament is called Papyra 52. It's this little credit card sized fragment of papyrus. And, or papyrus, whatever. And it's written on both sides, which is how we know it was part of the codex, or what we would call a book, or the, uh, the precursor to a book. In fact, there are a lot of archaeologists who think that it was Christians who first invented the idea of a codex, like a book, like leather-bound book, because before that, you know, they had scrolls and all that stuff, and we're getting off into the wood. But the Christians had a high view of Scripture, and they wanted everybody to be able to read it, so they, they came up with this way to kind of uh, assist in that. But that papyrus, papyrus 52, wouldn't you know it, is a fragment of the Gospel of John. And we know from dating the papyrus that it's uh, late first century or very early, like first couple years of the second century in origin. Meaning we have a little copy of the book of John from within 50 years of when it was written. Amen. And that may not sound super important to you, but when you compare that to the works that we have of, say, Plato and people like that, we have fragments of fragments of copies of those that are written hundreds of years or as we have thousands of copies of the New Testament. And some of them, like PE52, go back to less than 100 years from when the original was written. So you'll hear people say, well, I don't believe the Bible because it was written by man. It's like, well, if they doctored it, they had to do it really quickly, and they had to account for a lot of manuscripts in like four different languages. And they had to change all of those languages at right. once and put them back without nobody noticing. Right. And you, you, you think on that for longer than a few minutes, and you realize we know almost without a doubt, what every section of the New Testament said in the original manuscript. Amen. Because we have copies that are just too close to the time that the originals were written. But anyway, this is important for us because Christ holds people accountable for understanding his words. Um, in the story of um, Lazarus and the rich man, y'all remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is begging, and there's the rich man, he doesn't give him any food. Uh, and, and in Luke chapter 16, uh, Lazarus calls out to Abraham from his place of torment and he says, I have five brothers and he's trying to get Abraham to send somebody to go warn him uh, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment and listen to what, Ab what Christ says, Abraham says back to him quote, they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said, no father Abraham but if someone goes to them from the dead they will repent and keep in mind, this is written or Christ is saying this, he's teaching this before his death, because he's still alive he's the one teaching them this right. if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead yeah. now, obviously he's talking primarily about himself, but his point there is, people have the scriptures they're going to believe it if they're going to believe it, right. he holds people accountable to the scriptures they, they serve as our standard right. and so 
Uh, because Christ has given us his word, uh, we need to understand how to use it, how to interpret it, uh, how to apply it to our lives and all that. Which leads us to the next two, which are eisegesis and exegesis. You've probably heard of that word and probably haven't heard that word, just, just by, by odd. But there's, there's, a, there's a big difference between the two. Eisegesis is the opposite of exegesis. Shocker. But this is how the world treats scripture. Eisegesis means reading into the text preconceived notions that you have. Mm-hmm. Reading into the text something that isn't there. This is how the world handles scripture. Yeah. They, they, they want to justify uh, homosexuality, uh, divorce, abortion, um, their view of marriage. They want to justify whatever, and so they read that into the text. Yeah. Where, where an idea that was foreign to the authors of the text. Whereas the church, the people who are redeemed by Christ, and who are called by him, are called to a higher level of understanding. And we're called to properly exegete the text, which requires work. You can, it's not easy to understand every area of biblical doctrine. The core message, which we'll get to in a minute, is so simple that even a child can understand it. Mm-hmm. However, if we're going to faithfully understand all of the scripture, uh, there's a, there's a popular phrase uh, out of Moscow that's uh, uh, all of Christ for all of life. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to apply all of the scripture to our lives, uh, we have to be able to properly understand it and understand what the authors meant. And so our example of how to do that primarily comes from Christ. Because as we just mentioned, Christ viewed every word of scripture as the word of God. And so he understood that. When he went to scripture... He didn't say, well, I know it says this, but it can also kind of mean this, right? No, he understood it for its exact literal verbal meaning. Yeah. And that's what he taught his apostles to do. When you read the New Testament, which was written by his apostles, they quote all over the place from the Old Testament. And you don't hear them saying, well, see, this is kind of like this, and it's like an allegorical picture of this. And they say, no, this is what was spoken. Here's how it's fulfilled. This is the, the, the law of, of Moses. Here's how it applies to us. They had a lit- literal understanding of the text, and they applied it to their lives and to their uh, context. And not only the apostles, but we also have 2,000 years of faithful Christians behind us mm-hmm. that we stand on uh, that, that serve as an example. I like to think of uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who understood uh, how important it was to not compromise on the truth of the gospel. And so, because of his conviction, he was able to stand in the Colosseum and say, yeah, okay, send the wild beasts after me. I'm not going to recant. And you have Polycarp who said, you know, no, let him come. You threaten me with fire that burns for a second, but you have no idea about the fire that burns forever. These people were convinced, and they understood what they had been given, the message that was recorded in Scripture, and the purchase of their souls and salvation. And they would not, under pain of death, revoke any bit of that. Yeah. And it goes far beyond even the church fathers, going into the period of the Reformation. Some of the um, relics that a lot of uh, Reformed churches have in Europe is uh, one, of, one of the more common ones <clears throat> are tongue clips. And the reason that they have these metal tongue clips is because before they would burn uh, heretics at the stake, they would clip their tongues so they couldn't preach while they were being burned. And of course, all of them would be burned up and the only thing that their churches would have left of them were the metal tongue clips that didn't burn up in the fire. And so there are churches in Europe today that have, you know, this is our, our pile of uh, tongue clips from our uh, spiritual ancestors of the faith. Yeah, they, they had a lot more of a, a robust uh, history than, than a lot of American churches do. But anyway, they, they read the scripture, they understood its message, and they were faithful to it regardless of what anybody threatened. And, and, and they, they knew that primarily, and this gets us into the third one, uh, because of the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity is just a big word that means um, basic in its clarity, or clarity in its basics. What that means is, and we can see this in Christ, Christ says, have you not read? He charges them that they have the ability to understand it. Everyone has the ability to understand the basic message. Everyone has the ability, and God holds them to the ability, to be able to understand that they are a sinner, that God is holy, and something has to be done to bridge the gap, and that that's Christ. 
the simplistic aspect of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. We received his righteousness by faith. It's simple enough that God holds every single human Amen. accountable for it. This is one of the um, arguments uh, against Roman Catholicism. They argue that, well, no one can understand the scripture apart from the magisterium of the church. And the only ones who have the authority to infallibly interpret it are those who sit on the seats of Peter and they can infallibly tell you uh, what, the, what the scriptures mean. And then you go, okay, well, you guys have had 2,000 years. How much of the scripture have you defined for us? And it's like, this much. <laughs> because they know <laughs> they can't do that. The, they're not infallible. And Amen. I'm convinced deep down a lot of them know. But that's a whole other discussion. Christ believed, and he charges all of us to believe, that his word is both inspired, that he's the one who spoke it, uh, that we should properly understand it and know how to understand it, and that it, since the message is simple enough that everyone can understand it, he holds everyone to understand it. And this is why Christ had to fulfill the law. That's what he says here. You know, not uh, a yacht or tittle shall pass away, right? Uh, he says um, that he came to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. And there's a lot of people today who, who get those two mixed up. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But he comes to fulfill the law in every aspect. There are three main ways in which Christ comes to fulfill the law. The first is in perfect obedience. Righteousness um, comes through the obedience of the law, right? So Christ uh, has to do what we could not do. When God created Adam, he said, this is what you will do. This is what you will not do. And we did what we weren't supposed to do. And so we need Christ who is obedient to every aspect of the law. And that's the thing that even people who aren't Christians can read the New Testament and go, wow, this guy was a morally good guy, which is weird. How can they say that somebody was morally good? But anyway, that's, that's, that's a whole other issue. Uh, so the first way that he fulfills the law is through obedience. None of us could be perfectly obedient to the law in every respect like Christ was. The second way is through prophetic fulfillment. If you were here back during our study of Leviticus, um, you recall how we went through all of the different um, ceremonial aspects of the law. You know, don't wear mixed fabrics. Uh, eat this food, not that food. And we talked about how all of those were a parallel, were a prophetic foreshadowing of Christ, of Christ who is uh, um, the fulfillment of all of those laws. And even that, even further, the specific um, prophecies, uh, like, for example, Isaiah 53, of the suffering servant, or of Genesis chapter 49, where it talks about uh, Shiloh, who shall have the scepter. And you go through all 300 plus scriptures uh, of prophecy in the Old Testament, and Christ fulfilled every single one of them. And they're all recorded in the New Testament. And then finally, uh, the third way in which Christ fulfills the law is through his substitutionary atonement. So the law required that uh, for every sin, there must be death. That's even reiterated in the New Testament. The wages of sin is death. Right. And then it's pictured by God too. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned, the animal had to be killed. God tries or God clothes them with the sin with the skins of the animal. He is teaching them from the very beginning, and he would later spell it out to Moses that the only way that there is forgiveness of sins is the shedding of innocent blood, which again is a foreshadowing of Christ. And so Christ had to live a perfect, sinless life and die a sinless death for us, that through faith, his righteousness might be credited to us. And this is what Christ talks about in verse 19. In verse 19, he says, Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. When God speaks a command, it will happen. When he gives a prophecy, it will happen. Again, this, this verse is another strong passage affirming verbal inerrancy. That when God speaks, and it's recorded in the scriptures, that they are infallibly written down through the authority of the Holy Spirit. And Christ validated his message throughout history too. Much of what happens in the gospel is Christ pronouncing judgment on those who hear him. He says, you know, um, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And people are like, well, Jerusalem's been around for all this time. Look at all these big stones. And the apostles are like, yeah, okay, sure thing, Jesus. We're going to 
And then later, whenever the Holy, they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, they have wisdom and they can understand. They're like, oh man, the temple's going to be destroyed. And they, they kept teaching that. And, and when you know, uh, Christ's fulfillment came uh, exactly when he said he would. There, was, there were some who had heard him say that, who didn't taste death before they saw Jerusalem destroyed. And it was flattened exactly uh, in the way that he said it would. So this is just one way that when we can understand that when God speaks, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, whatever he speaks is inspired, it comes with his authority, and it will come to pass. Amen. And his sheep will hear his voice. Which is why it's important for us to understand the law of God, which is kind of the theme that Christ is uh, revolving this teaching around. He is working out his will in the world, and he commands us to be a part of it, specifically at the end of this gospel. The last part of Matthew, Christ says, this is after his ascension, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We can't teach anyone to observe all that he's commanded if we don't know what he's commanded. Amen. So, what does that look like? Well, some will try and advocate for what's called antinomianism. And they won't call it that because <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But, <laughs> but basically, what antinomianism, anti means against, nomianism, the nomina comes from uh, the word meaning law. They are against the law of God. They say, you know, uh, well, Christ has paid for all my sins. doesn't really matter how I live now because all of the sin that I'm going to do, he's already forgiven me for. I can just live, you know, we're under grace. We're not under law. We can do whatever we want, right? That's a popular idea today. Even if it's not expressed that way, that's a popular idea today. And, of course, you all know that's, that's directly counter to Scripture. Romans chapter 6 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Like the King James says, God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In Christ, in John 14, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. We can't legitimately say that we love Christ if we do not submit to his lordship. Amen. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to say that Christ is my savior, he has to also be your lord. You can't have one without the other. He is in charge, and you are not. And more than that, as we grow in our love of Christ, and our love for Christ, we cannot separate love from obedience. Because the biblical definition of love is not some wishy-washy feeling. It is a verb. It is a devotion. And when it comes to Christ, that brings about obedience by necessary implication. When we grow in our love for Christ... We have to grow in our love for his law because we cannot separate him from his law. David understood this. In Psalm 119, he writes, Oh, how I love your law. He didn't write that early on in his life. It took him a while to grow into that. And this is one of the harder things for parents, as a lot of you know far better than I do. It's easy to teach your, well, it's not easy. It's one thing to teach your kids to obey. It's another thing to teach your kids to love to obey. And that's what we have to do as Christians if we're going to grow in our faith. We have to learn to love God's law. And I say learn seriously because it's contrary to our nature. Our natural Amen. nature wants to do what's contrary and hostile to God's law. But he promises to indwell us with the Holy Spirit who will strengthen us and equip us to learn to love God's law. And apart from his law, there is no standard of right and wrong. And apart from his law, none of this makes any sense anyway. And that's one of the things that we need to be really aware of. So we're commanded to know uh, God's law, and specifically, we're called to tell others to obey all that Christ has commanded. Again, not very popular today. Today, the world is saying, yeah, you guys believe what you want to believe, but shut up and go over there in your churches and, and stop getting in the public square. Well, if they didn't want us in the public square, they shouldn't have killed Christ in the public square. That's where they messed up. <laughs> but he's commanded us to go into the public square and command obedience from all men. And so we have to know how to do that. And what does that look like? Look at verse 19. Christ says, Therefore, whoever relaxes 
one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is why it's so problematic when people like Andy Stanley say they want to unhitch from the Old Testament. That's a big deal. That's the law and the prophets that Christ told us to know. Christ isn't teaching people in the Gospels here to do away with the Old Testament. He's the one who wrote the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. If you look at the book of Leviticus, we made this point, that if, if you were to, to do the words of God in red, like some people do in the New Testament with Leviticus, it would be the reddest book in the Bible. Because the only time that humans speak are to recount stories. Other than that, it's all God speaking law. <clears throat> He's the one who wrote it. And his purpose here is teaching them to understand the purpose of that law. And so if you're familiar, if you were here when we studied Leviticus, you understand that the law, that the law is properly divided into three sections. And this is implicit from Scripture based on how the apostles use it and how the apostles quote from the Old Testament. So the, that threefold division of the law is the ceremonial aspects of the law. And you remember that's talking about um, this is what the priests are to wear. These are the regulations for ceremonial washing. This is how you, what garments you're supposed to wear. This is, uh, and, and it goes on and goes on and goes on. And we talked about how those are object lessons, and this is the point of Paul in Colossians chapter 2. All of those things were a shadow of what is to come, or what was to come, in Christ. They, they had to wear, uh, they couldn't mix their fabrics. It was an object lesson to teach them that even in putting on clothes, they were God's people. They were to be separate from the world. And you go through all those object lessons, and I won't reiterate our entire Leviticus study, but you can go and listen to that if you'd like. The second is the civil aspect of the law. So those were legal restrictions that God put out on Israel. Uh, one of them, for example, is if you're going to, um, or the law was you have to have a parapet or a wall around your roof. Okay, And you're like, okay, do it. If, if I'm going to obey the law of God, do I need to go put a rail around my roof? What, is that, what does that mean? Well, you have to understand the context. During that day, people hung out on the roof. That was the place where everyone had dinner. And so, you had to have a railing around it, otherwise people would fall off. And so, we don't hang out on our roof anymore, so the this, this specific letter of that civil law doesn't apply to us. However, the general equity of the law does. Yeah. Right. We, as Christians, as people who understand God, that has an effect on every area of our life. That means taking care of your property. You shouldn't have jagged pieces of metal just hanging out everywhere. That's the, that's the general equity of that law. Right. We, if, if we're expecting guests, we need to make sure that our property is safe and not going to injure anyone. And that's what is meant by the general equity of the law. The law is still very much, that part of the law, the civil law, is still very much valid to us. Even if we don't have the specific aspects of it, the principles of it are unchanging. Because God is unchanging. And right and wrong does not change. Even though the cultures and the context and the application of those laws may change over time. Finally, the most important for us is the moral law. This is quoted so often in the New Testament. And so the moral law is primarily pictured in the Ten Commandments. You know, Thou shalt not. It's black and white moral instruction. And the apostles quote from that all the time. Christ is the author of creation. He is the one who spoke those words. And he by no means destroys any of these. But rather, this is what he's talking about here. He fulfills he fulfills the ceremonial aspects of the law through his sacrifice, through his perfect life. Those were pictures of him. He has fulfilled them. That's how he can say, I declared all, or thus he declared all foods clean, right? And he can tell Peter, take, get up and eat. I have fulfilled that. That was a picture of me. It is fulfilled. You no longer have that object lesson because there is a different way in which I'm interacting with the world now. And I don't want to spend too much time on that. You can listen to our Leviticus study. He fulfills the civil and the moral law through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When he indwells us, he teaches us and guides us into understanding the law and equipping us because we wouldn't in our natural state want to obey him. Mm -hmm. But through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he equips us to uh, follow him and to be able to complete and to obey his law. And this is what he gets at in verse 20. In verse 20 he says, For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that 
of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, the scribes and Pharisees were experts of the law. They spent their entire lives devoting themselves to understanding every little bit of what that meant so that they could somehow earn through good works the ability to enter heaven, earn justification, earn righteousness. So how are we going to exceed their lives? I mean, they lived off of the temple tax. They had nothing to do all day but study. How is our righteousness going to exceed that? This is the same question that Nicodemus comes to Christ with in John chapter 3. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of that. In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, it says, Truly, I tru truly, truly, I say to you, this is Christ talking to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, okay, great, thanks for that, that helps. Way to clear that up, Jesus. <laughs> Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we kind of have a tendency when we read that story to think of Nicodemus as kind of a dummy. Uh, he's asking about going back and being born again. No. Nicodemus was the teacher in Israel. He knew, he understood that with that question, it was rhetorical. He's like, what do you want me to do? I can't obviously be physically born again. What must I do? And that's the point that Christ is trying to make. It's not something that you do. He's telling Nicodemus, you had no way, you had no control of when you were going to be physically born, and you have no control how you're going to be born again. And this is where the reformers got regeneration precedes faith. And you can go and listen to our message from a couple weeks ago. But Christ gives him an impossible standard of obedience. And he gives them here an impossible standard of obedience. Because nothing we can ever do will earn that righteousness. Mm -hmm. We cannot earn it. And we would not even want to earn it. Mm -hmm. But we must be, as R.C. said, justified by works. That's the only way any of us are justified. Now you're like, hold on. Wait a minute. That's contrary to what you said. Now let me explain. And we talked a little bit about this in Sunday school. The only way any of us will ever be justified is by works, but not by our works. The only way any of us will ever be justified is by the work of Christ, by his perfect sacrifice imputed to us judicially, legally through faith and that's the gospel Paul spells this out for us in Galatians chapter 2 he says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law no one will be justified that's the gospel message the gospel means good news. But we need to know why we need good news if it's going to make any sense to us. And for us to understand that, we need to know how far we've fallen individually and collectively from the perfect and holy law and standard of God. I say collectively. That's echoing Isaiah. When he sees the holiness of God, he says, I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. He understood there was something, sin, separating him and humanity as a whole from God. And whenever we embrace Christ, whenever we come to accept the good news, it's not time for us to then kick our feet back up and relax and say, well, he's done all this work for us. We're now justified. We don't have to do anything at all. We're just going to sit here. We're just going to live the same way. You know, everything's just going to be great. Again, antinomianism. That's not it. Rather, we're called to be born again, not to stay infants, but that, so that we can grow up. And that's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, 
that you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted that the Lord is good, if you've experienced grace, you will want to grow up into the faith. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So both individually, as individual Christians, and collectively, as local churches, Scripture is clear. We need to grow up. Amen. And that's the message that the American church needs to hear. Amen. And we do that by growing up in holiness. Peter quotes from the Old Testament and says, Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. We grow up by learning to love the law of God. So how do we do that? This is our application. Any, any good message should have an exposition of the text and an application. How do we apply that to our lives? Well, look at the first one. Verbal plenary inspiration. This is how we are to view the word of God. We, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, have to come to the same understanding of scripture as Christ. These are the words of God. They're not the words of man. They're the words of God. Written through men, yes, but they have authority in them. They have divine authority in them. Number two, exegesis and exegesis. This is how we submit to the word. That's not a popular word in our culture today. We people don't like to being told to submit to anything. But as the famous prophet Bob Dylan once said, you're going to have to serve somebody. Amen. And it better be God. <laughs> We're called by Christ to be able to properly understand the scripture for what it is. And that leads us into the third one, the first beauty of scripture. This is how we preach the word. This is how we preach the message of the gospel. We don't preach it like, well, what if they don't understand it? Or, well, what if they don't really believe? No, scripture is clear. God has made himself revealed. He's revealed himself to every single person through the work of creation. And he holds them accountable for understanding the scripture. And so we can preach it with boldness wherever we are and to whomever we will because God holds them accountable not us God has spoken and they can understand it then finally antinomianism and theonomy in particular theonomy is just a big word which means God's law that's antinomianism anti-law theo God theon God's law because God has spoken and because he holds his people accountable to what he has spoken, we must obey God by loving our neighbors enough to tell them that there is a better way and to call them to obedience to that higher way. This is why Christians fight for the abolition of abortion, for the end of no-fault divorce, for the, end, for the establishment of biblical marriage, and the list goes on. Throughout the last 2,000 years, Christians have fought for the establishment of laws that represent God's system of morality, not ours, because we are not infallible. And our own systems of morality will only reflect our own fallenness. Amen. There is no standard of right and wrong <coughs> apart from Christ. And anyone who says they can come up with right and wrong apart from Christ and apart from God's law, listen to the argument. Judge for yourself. It doesn't work. We seek to honor God in every sphere, so that we can truly say, we fulfilled the Great Commission. When we do the Lord's Prayer, and we, we pray that his kingdom would come, and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, we need to be able to say that we did our best to make that happen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that your spirit would indwell us, would teach us, would guide us into the truth that you have revealed, that it would transform us by the renewing of our minds, or that we would treasure it, apply it to our lives, and be able to speak it accurately and boldly to those around us, or that you would give us confidence, security, and peace as we grow up into the image of Christ, who has purchased us with his blood, and in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have your white binders, finish up. Catechism number nine today.
talking about the, the history of the church. This is something that the church has done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and is lost in most uh, modern churches, and I think uh, to their great detriment. We talk a lot about memorization. We talked a good bit about memorization in Sunday school. This is how we do that. So if you're uh, new to this practice, the, the questions in bold, uh, I will read, and then the congregation responds with the answer. Question 63. Which is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. What is required in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment requireth the preserving the honor and performing the duties belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. What is forbidden in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment forbiddeth the neglecting of or doing anything against the honor and duty which belongeth to everyone in their several places and relations. What is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment? The reason annexed to the fifth commandment is a promise of long life and prosperity as far as it shall serve for God's glory and their own good to all such as keep this commandment. What is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, Thou shalt not kill. What is required in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment requireth all lawful endeavors to preserve your own life and the life of others. What is forbidden in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment forbiddeth the taking away of our own life or the life of our neighbor unjustly, or whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Which is the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. What is required in the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment requireth the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. What is forbidden in the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment forbiddeth all unchaste thoughts, words, and actions. The law of God is not some esoteric thing that applies to the spiritual realm. It is deeply practical for every area of our life, and it needs to be taught today more than any era in recent history. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.